The 1971 war completes 50 years on 16th December this year. The historic war in which the 93,000 Pakistani soldiers had surrendered to the Indian Army and the Mukti Bahini. The war was fought in unison by the three forces. Today we have Major General Sharab Pachauri, Vishisht Seva Medal, a very senior retired infantry officer of the Indian Army, to talk about. the indian army in the 1971 war uh, good afternoon uh, general pachauri and welcome to the uh, third episode of guts and glory the saga of guts and glory of the 71 war so as we all know that the 71 war was a big victory for india because uh, the indian armed forces made the 93000 pakistani soldiers uh, surrender to indian, the indian armed forces uh, in all and the mukti bahini and it is uh, the shortest war in the history of india so today we have you with us and uh, there could be no better person than you to tell us uh, more about the history of uh, the war thank you uh, diksha and uh, jai hind to my viewers who i presume are young viewers uh, as i have already been introduced i'll not waste time on that except to say that i was not fortunate enough to be a part of this uh, war which indeed uh, as uh, diksha pointed out was uh, one of the most glorious moments in uh, not only the history of the indian army but the history of the country uh, i was actually commissioned in 1982 so that would make it 11 years after the war finished but yes as a student of military history and as an army officer who retired some time back uh, who has served in a lot of these areas and who's also taught in certain uh, uh military establishments uh, uh i will give you uh, my perspective on uh, how things were and how it indeed uh, turned out to be a glorious chapters written in uh, letters of gold in the annals of uh, in the indian army well i would uh, just take you back young boys and girls and also my other viewers a little bit into history not too much uh, as you know that the bengal that we have today is known as west bengal before partition uh, there was another part of bengal and the entire area was called bengal but that part which is now bangladesh was what is euphemistically referred to as east bengal and later after partition it became east pakistan because as you are aware pakistan was created uh, on the basis of uh, the two nation theory now uh, where in the muslim predominant areas and those who wanted to leave uh, went to pakistan and others stayed behind in india and it also had to do with contiguity in the sense that the areas on the west bordering punjab uh, gujarat and the areas on the east bordering bengal which were muslim predominant uh, chose to or rather were were were, were made into pakistan and uh, areas in the heartland such as hyderabad which also had a muslim predominant uh, uh, population then uh, could obviously not have gone to pakistan and then we had the operation polo etc which i'll not go into right now right so that is how the east pakistan was created so there were two distinct parts of pakistan and i'm sure the uh, moderator will uh, show you a map which will give you a very clear idea of what is now today's pakistan and what was prior to 1971 east pakistan so this whole area or region or nation of pakistan was divided by a huge land mass uh, of india almost 1650 kilometers uh, which could neither be traversed by land nor really flown over given the hostilities and the other route was via the arabian sea through the uh, uh, below the, uh, uh, the that is to the pak strait route so uh, actually pakistan was two huge land masses one was west pakistan punjabi dominated and the other was east pakistan now right from the beginning there was a little bit of um, problem with the east pakistanis who were basically bengalis bengali muslim uh, who who never treated them fairly and squarely and evenly and equally i would say uh, they considered them inferior not martial enough not aggressive enough uh, you know there were there were certain very unprintable 
things and unpredictable words that they used for them, which I would not, not like to say here. And uh, over a period of time, this tension grew and they were totally against the use of Bengali language and they also wanted to impose Urdu uh, on them, to which these proud uh, Muslim Bengalis were very averse. And I will cut a long story short and, and, and just tell you that they had a great leader in Sheikh Muzibur Rahman who uh, won uh, the elections from the Awami League. But in March 71, he was arrested and brought to West Pakistan and put under arrest. Uh, this sort of resulted in a rebellion of sorts in then East Pakistan, who started demanding independence from Pakistan. Uh, uh, West Pakistan sent a, a, a large component of its army to suppress the rebellion in the process of which untold, untold atrocities were committed on uh, the people of East Pakistan, including a rape of lakhs of women, murder of more than a million Bengalis, and uh, many other such unspeakable horrors, which resulted in a huge humanitarian crisis and uh, uh, the uh, persecuted Bangla, uh, the East Pakistanis, it was not Bangladesh then, started pouring into India, into the states of West Bengal, Assam, Tripura, uh, Meghalaya, and even Mizoram, and, and even as far south as Bihar. And then it became a huge uh, crisis, an economic crisis for India to look after so many refugees. So the Indian Prime Minister then, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, uh, decided that a stop had to be put to this, and the only way to do this probably was to uh, you know, prevail upon the Pakistani establishment to stop the atrocities and and, and, and let the Bangladeshis have their, uh, the, the East Pakistanis have their independence. Uh, of course, there was a diplomatic thrust, Sadar Soran Singh, who was the foreign minister then, and Indira Gandhi herself spoke to a lot of international leaders, met on, uh, went on a whirlwind tour of a lot of countries to, to highlight the atrocities being committed by Pakistan. There was a mixed response from the world community at that time. And then she finally called her chief of army staff, the legendary, uh, then General uh, Sam Manikshaw, later Field Marshal, and asked her uh, uh, around the 25th of March, 1971, uh, that she would like uh, to go to war uh, uh, with Pakistan for the liberation of Bangladesh. And uh, General Manikshaw, uh, being the kind of person, the the, 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 the legendary military leader that he was, brought out a couple of reasons. And he said, look, uh, there are these massive rivers in uh, Bangladesh, the Padma, the Meghna, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, which flows as Jamna there. And the monsoons are sh around the corner. And when the, and in his words, he said, when it, when it rains, it pours. So our equipment, our infantry, our armor, the mechanized columns, etc., will not be able to cross these uh, rivers and we'll be bogged down. And we, we may be staring at defeat. I told, I told her that we will need all national resources, including your trains and trucks and all sorts of transport. And this is also the cropping season. Uh, so the agriculture will suffer. And the third aspect that he brought out was that at this point of time, that is in March, April, and subsequently May, June, July, the passes, mountain passes are open and China would then, through the Himalayas, be able to come to the assistance of its all-weather ally, that is Pakistan, and that would make things a little difficult for India. And so he said, but you give me seven, eight months, in which time I will not only prepare my troops, train my troops, I'll muster my forces, I'll have some of my equipment, particularly the armored equipment, the mechanized equipment. If you do not, do not understand, armored is what relates to tanks. Uh, uh, mechanized is what relates, relates to APCs, that is the armored personal carrier, and so on and so forth. And I will be, and I assure you, madam, he said, of victory uh, if, if you allow me to go uh, during that time. Uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi agreed uh, uh, and saw light in the general's arguments and uh, agreed uh, and asked uh, him to prepare for war. And in the interim period, a lot of diplomatic efforts, a lot of political efforts, uh, economic efforts, et cetera, were undertaken to make sure that uh, this, uh, that we, we wage a victorious war. And which is why 
it is the while the army air force and the navy indeed did play a stellar role uh, i would say as a student of military history that this was a national effort uh, including the diplomacy the political leadership of the time the oppos opposition uh, and so many other things into which i would not like to go right now for paucity of time and uh, the last bit that i would like to add before i take your next question is that on 3rd of december 1971 uh pakistan uh, uh launched uh, uh massive air strikes on a number of our forward air bases in fact down to agra srinagar amritsar uh, uh, ambala and, and and a few others so that in a manner of speaking made them the aggressors which diplomatically made our position a little stronger because the world community always sort of looks down upon the aggressor and uh, seems to sympathize with the victim as it were so the war was started on 3rd of december by pakistan but ended by us and i'll tell you more about it depending on your questions on 16th of december on our terms so moving ahead uh, we often hear uh, the role of mukti bahini in the uh, entire war uh it would be great if you could just uh, tell our viewers and listeners a little more about the mukti bahini force yeah you see uh, as happens when 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 a people and i say a people as in the collective sense uh when a people are oppressed there is always uh, rebellion there is always resistance as happened in france as happened in poland as happened in Uh, if you see if you if you know your military history you would know that resistance fronts were formed by various uh, uh, nations so mukti bahani was a force of die hard bengali guerrillas now this is not gorilla guerrillas are, uh, are 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 fighters who oppose uh, a repressive regime and mukti bahani uh, was uh, uh, a force of die hard uh, well trained motivated aggressive and ferocious uh, native uh, local uh, bengalis uh, in east pakistan who rose up in arms against the uh, the the uh, the oppression of the west pakistani forces and uh, they were trained well and uh, india also played uh, its role uh, a bit of it in uh, training them uh and uh, they they indeed and when the when eventually the indian army entered uh, east pakistan they were a huge source of support for us uh and uh, did indeed play a major role in ensuring success because they were locals and most important aspect in in warfare is intelligence and in those days 1971 uh, we did not have the kind of intelligence means technologically which are available today so now when we come to uh, that phase uh, during a conversation we are talking about the war so the attacks from the pakistan from the aggressor happened on 3rd december 1971 we were fully prepared so now because we are talking to you so we will specifically talk about the actions by the indian army so uh, could you please uh, explain our listeners and uh, viewers Uh, what was the first action by the in retaliatory action by the indian army and then uh, moving ahead we'll also discuss the important uh, battles of wars during the uh, complete 71 war okay that's a very good question uh, uh, diksha and uh, what i would like to say here is uh, uh, that uh, a war takes place a war that is a nation is deemed to be at war when uh, when the parliament of the country declares that the nation is at war and there are various uh, connotations there is a union war book and and all that i will not uh, sort of burden your viewers with that but uh, you know war is not a simple business as you see in movies and as you present at the moment uh, there are so many video games in which you see fancy soldiers carrying fancy weapons and tanks and space uh, ships and missiles and so it it first and foremost thing that it that it entails is mobilization you know india is a vast country our military uh, formations and units as they are called are located all over the country each one of them has a designated role at a particular place so to move those forces from east to west or north to south 
uh, you know, requires several trains, uh, road surface transport, sometimes aircraft, sometimes even ships. So that is a major exercise. Now, what the Indian Army's major thrust, and I would keep it very simple and very short, uh, was that uh, the idea of this war was to liberate Dhaka and create an independent nation, which, as you all know, we eventually did. So the aggression was more on the a, on a eastern side. Whereas, as I would like you all to understand, that a war, once it starts, there is no assurance that it will remain localized or restricted to the area where you started it. So obviously, we had to take preventive and defensive measures on our Western front. So on our Western front, that is Rajasthan, Punjab, even Gujarat, to some extent, uh, we had to ensure that we had good defenses so that uh, Pakistan did not uh, take advantage uh, uh, as we were busy on the east of bringing in its forces and capturing some of our territory, which eventually uh, some, some bit of war did, did, did in, in fact, a major part of the war took place uh, in the uh, Western theater also, but the bulk of it was under the Eastern command. We were offensive in the East and uh, a sort of defensive in the West. Now in the same vein, since uh, Diksha asked about the famous battles, I'd like to, to make a very brief mention of the first uh, battle that took place in the West and that was the battle of Longewala. Uh, Longewala is a is a small little place in Jaisalmer district, right on the border near Tanot. Now, this uh, Longewala was a small little uh, village defended by just one company. One company is about 120 men under a major, uh, and uh, sometimes there's a second officer known as a company officer who who can be a captain or a lieutenant. And uh, against this force of 120 people, Pakistan, a whole Pakistani brigade. So he came in with tanks uh, and he, he had his information. You must understand, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that whenever there's a war, there are spies on either side who pass on information of your troop movement, deployment, etc., to the other country. So they came to know that there are there is just a just one company of 23 Punjab under uh, an officer who became legendary known as uh, Major uh, Kuldeep Singh Chandpuri, Mahavir Chakra. But he lived to tell the tale. He died, in fact, uh, a couple of years back. Uh, and uh, his leadership uh, thwarted uh, this major attack. And in those days, you must understand that the Air Force Air Force on either side did not have night flying capability. Hawaii jahaz jo hote the, agar main Hindi mein bol sakun, wo sirf din ko orte the and they could only strike uh, during uh, daylight. Now, of course, uh, with advanced technology, 50 years down the line, we have night fighting and all those things. So these, uh, the, the brigade of Pakistan attacked them at night and these people had a few mines which they put over there when these tanks came, the first initial two, three tanks hit those mines and they were blown up. So these people were very surprised and Major Chandpuri had very effectively deployed his uh, company over an area of two kilometers and fire opened from all sides. And these people, the Pakistani brigade were all at sea uh, and they were not even sure whether there are just 120 people here or a whole battalion. A battalion is four companies, four rifle companies, and plus of course they have supporting elements or even more. And so uh, the, the movie Border with Sunny Deol uh, playing the role of Major Chandpuri is actually based on the Battle of Longewala. Some of you may have seen that movie. Of course, it's a, it's a pictorial depiction with certain liberties, cinematic liberties as they are having been taken. So uh, you give them allowance for that, but it's still a reasonably good movie. So they held them at bay for all night and in the morning, at first light, as we call in military parlance, daybreak uh, in your parlance, uh, the, the Indian Air Force with their hunters. That time we used to have uh, several aircraft, but one of them was hunters. Uh, they came and wreaked havoc on the Pakistani tanks, the Pakistani infantry. And uh, the this Indian company of 23 Punjab lost only two men. So, uh, you know, uh, as an infantry soldier, I'm very proud to narrate the story. 
of another infantry regiment, Punjab regiment, a very fine regiment of the Indian Army. And I would like my young friends who are watching this to understand that, uh, you know, you it's a tribute to, our, to the grit, determination and absolute, uh, uh, un, absolutely unquestionable combative spirit of our soldiers, officers and jawans that won us this war. So even as I talk to you, I salute them and, and say a big Jai Hind. So this is how, uh, and then of course, once the, once the uh, Air Force came in in the morning, I'm talking about Battle of Longewala, uh, then it was just a question of time. The, in, you can see if you Google Battle of Longewala, some of the burnt tanks, these were pattern tanks supplied by America, uh, uh, known to be at that point uh, in history, uh, the most invincible uh, tank. Of course, there were other tanks also that Pakistanis had. Uh, so, and, and many of them are displayed in, in several war uh, uh, museums uh, in India. Destroyed Pakistani tanks. So this was the Battle of Longewala and for which uh, Major Kuldeep Singh Chanpuri was awarded the Mahavir Chakra, which is the second highest uh, military uh, uh, award for gallantry in India. The highest being the Paramvir Chakra. And I'll kill it here only. In this war of 1971, India won four Paramvir Chakras, three uh, in the Army and one in the Air Force. Uh, this was Second Lieutenant Arun Khetrapal of uh, 17 Puna Horse, that is an armored regiment in the Battle of Basantar. Basantar is a big river. Uh, uh, then there was, uh, and Arun Khetrapal was only 21 years old when he died. There was Major Hoshiar Singh, who later retired as Colonel Hoshiar Singh and died in 1998. Uh, he's from the Grenadiers Regiment. Uh, he, uh, Infantry Regiment, he, he won the Paramvi Chakra. There was Lance Naik Albert Ikka. Uh, Lance Naik is a rank just above Sipai. The rank structure of the Indian Army is you start uh, with a Sipai, you become a Lance Naik, that is one stripe, then you become a Naik, that is two stripes then a Havaldar, that is three strikes, and then you become a junior commissioned officer and so on and so forth. Uh, Lance Naik Albert Ikka uh, got it in the Battle of Ganga Sagar uh, in Bangladesh. It is known as the Battle of Hili, but that is a larger this thing. I will not go into those details. And then there was this, this most valiant Air Force officer uh, called uh, Flying Officer Nirmal, Nirmal Jeet Singh Sekho who defended uh, the Srinagar airfield against a ferocious Pakistani air attack single-handedly in his NAT uh, uh, aircraft, and he died in the process. So three of these awards were posthumous. Uh, uh, Arun Khetrapal, uh, Albert Ikka, and Nirvaljit Singh Sekho. And Hoshiar Singh, of course, fortunately lived to tell the tale. And as an instructor in the Indian Military Academy, uh, I had occasion to meet uh, this legendary soldier, God bless his soul. And I must also share with my young viewers here that the living Paramvir Chakras, of whom there are only five now uh, in India, they uh, form part of the Republic Day Parade, as do some of the Ashok Chakra Vajitas. Ashok Chakra is an equivalent of all. But the very next day, that is 5th of December, the Navy came into uh, the battle and... Uh, uh, it destroyed uh, uh, the Karachi Harbor, uh, which was on fire, including their, their uh, oil uh, tanks, etc., for seven whole days. And a number of their frigates and boats and ships were sunk. Uh, so, so, so as I said, it was a joint effort and one of the finest examples of jointness, not only within the three wings of the military, that is the Army, Navy and the Air Force, but as I said in the past, of all the uh, elements and components of national power, as it is called, which of course has certain intangibles also, which we shall right now uh, not get into. If you have. Uh, so moving ahead, uh, so there are certain um, tidbits in a war, uh, like a very big war, thi. it was a 13 day long affair. I'm sure there are certain incidents which would be of a uh, a lot of interest to our viewers and listeners. I would be grateful to you if you could share some of them, uh, some interesting moments. Yeah, uh, listen, like I said, Diksha, I was not part of that war. So whatever I am sharing with you is from my knowledge, reading, observation, 
uh, viewing, etc. But uh, just to share a couple of uh, interesting points with you. Uh, despite the hostility that is there between, let's say, India and Pakistan or India and China, of which we are seeing a lot lately, uh, a soldier respects another soldier. That soldier and you, like, like if I'm confronted on the line of control, we used to fire at each other all the time. We used to even abuse each other on the radio sets and things. And anybody who served on the line of control uh, would tell you that. This is in the pre ceasefire days uh, because I commanded my battalion on the line of control more than 21 years back. But uh, you respect a soldier. He is doing for his nation what you are doing for your nation. He is not accepted to give you quarters or, or, or cede an inch of space just as you are not. So one or two very interesting incidents of the 71 war is uh, times it so happened that in an intense battle, between two opposing, let's say, battalions or armored uh, uh, components like squadrons or regiments or even troops. Uh, the enemy fought valiantly, but there were no witnesses to their valor. They died on their tanks, which were burnt, or they died on their artillery guns positions or infantry soldiers. So there are instances when Indian commanding officers placed on the dead body a citation. Citation kehte hain. Uh, a, a deed of valor uh, with a piece of paper torn out of the diary which uh, each one of us are supposed to carry. Uh, now you have mobiles and things, but those days there were no such things. So they tore off two pages from their diary and wrote uh, in English or if there are some, somebody who knew Urdu uh, in the, and we have all sorts of troops and there is no distinction between Muslim, Hindu troops or, or any such thing. Each one of them uh, fights for the nation about his act of valor based on which, based on that little slip of paper pinned on to the tunic of the dead uh, enemy soldier, that person has been awarded the highest uh, uh, military honor of Pakistan. Uh, so so those, those are stories which, which should, uh, uh, which talk about character within the defense forces. There is no personal enmity, right? There have been instances of wavered uh, uh, Pakistani soldiers who have possibly deserted uh, their uh, units because of fear, wandering into Indian, uh, onto the Indian camp or Indian side or Indian battalions and having been treated most decently uh, with good food, uh, hot tea, uh, and uh, at the end of the war returned most peacefully. Uh, another incident which comes to light is that after we took these prisoners of war, uh, they were uh, uh, not concentrated, all 93,000 of them were not at one place in India. They were all over various cantonments from Jalandhar to Jabalpur to Meerut to, you know, various. And the then chief of staff would visit them. He would visit their bathrooms and latrines to ask them, Ke bhai, khana theek mil hai aapko? Aapka bathroom saaf hai? And there is an incident of a Subedar Major or of the Pakistani Army. Their rank structures in ours is generally the same. A Subedar Major is the senior most uh, junior commissioned officer and he is the right hand man of the commanding officer of the battalion or, or they call, they're called Risaldar Majors in the armored uh, regiments uh, in matters related to welfare of troops, etc. And he said to Field Marshal Manik Shaw, Ke saab agar aapke jaise or aapke Indian Army ke jaise officers Talk a lot about the surrender, surrender, surrender. But how did the surrender happen? What made the Pakistani army and its soldiers surrender? Yeah, you see, uh, there was not one single factor which precipitated the surrender. After the war had lasted for about 12 to 13 days, uh, India was making a three pronged uh, uh, sort of a charge or uh, uh, advance towards Dhaka, which and its fall was imminent. Dhaka would have fallen. By then, uh, by that time, a number of uh, Pakistani posts, uh, Pakistani uh, sort of uh, uh, establishments had fallen. Uh, what had happened, you would also recall, and some of the readers would know that Pakistan turned to America for help. America sent its US 7th uh, fleet 
uh, headed by the aircraft carrier enterprise, USS Enterprise, which was at that time the uh, biggest uh, nuclear powered and carrying nuclear weapons, nuclear powered and nuclear, uh, nuclear powered only means that it is it, it, the power to, to sort of have that ship going is provided by nuclear power. But nuclear armed means it has, it also carries nuclear weapons. So even they came to the Bay of Bengal to threaten India, at which time uh, India did not buckle. It was strong political leadership of Mrs. Gandhi as well. And it must be given where it is due, quite apart from our own. India had at that time only one aircraft carrier known as INS Vikrant, mm -hmm. uh, which was much smaller in size uh, compared to the USS Enterprise. Even England sent one of its frigates known as HMS Eagle and some other countries sent. But then Russia, our all-time uh, uh, ally, ally then, it was uh, still USSR. Uh, it, it came to our assistance by deploying some of its own uh, uh, 40th fleet, it's called, somebody calls it, they, they don't have a fleet system, so somebody calls it something else. But suffice it to say that they also said, So that Pakistan, uh, diplomatically, politically, militarily, economically, yes, after the Karachi harbor was uh, put out of action, no supplies could come to uh, uh, Karachi is the biggest port in Pakistan. Now tell that so how will uh, your supplies come? Chahe wo aapka oil ho, chahe aapka khana peena ho, chahe aapka ammunition ho, chahe kuch bhi ho aapka. Iske alawa, there was an incident of PNS Ghazi. PNS stands for Pakistan Naval Ship. Ghazi was a, was a submarine again sold to or given to Pakistan by America, which was sunk off the Vishakhapatnam coast by uh, INS Rajput. INS Rajput was in a dock for repair and refitment. So it, it, it's, it's a long story how uh, uh, I, this Ghazi submarine was looking for destroying INS Vikrant after we had sunk their, uh, uh, their ship. They had to lure INS Ghazi to the INS Ghazi to tell us that INS Vikrant is going to come to Vishaka Patnam coast. And they had to tell us about the news and news. They had to tell us about the news and news. They had to tell us about the news and news. They had to tell us about the news and news. They had to tell us about uh, meat, bread, uh, eggs, uh, rations for six months of stocking of a huge ship for purchase just to make the enemy believe that INS Vikrant is going to dock in Vishakhapatnam, whereas it was nowhere there. Usko dhunte huye ye PNS Gazi samudra ke niche chalti huye vaan pahunch gai. And that was then destroyed by INS Rajput, which was not even an operation, operational ship at that point of time. So it was, and then of course, as I said, army was was having a complete rollover because that time in uh, the, the 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 terrain was suitable for tank movement. Rivers were at their uh, the pani jo hota hai, wo all time low pe tha. Us taraf passes bante. China could have done nothing. Uh, diplomatically, India um, was putting pressure on Pakistan. So all these things led to the fact that General Niazi, uh, General Niazi, who was the commander in the Eastern Front in Pakistan, was, I'm told, given just about 40 minutes to sign the surrender document. Initially, I'm also told, but I'm not very sure, that Pakistan insisted on a UN-brokered ceasefire. Now, that would have been a totally different thing. Uska matlab hota ke aapka United Nations intervention forces ne ceasefire kara diya hai, aap log se ladenge nahi. But India said no, and that is where General Jacob comes in. You mentioned General Jacob. That the surrender will be unilateral. Unilateral meaning ke bhaiya hum haar mante hai, aapke haath jodte hai, aapke ghutno pe girte hai. All these, uh, a combination of all these factors, I hope uh, Diksha, I've been able to answer your question that having been surrounded from all sides, their supplies having been cut off, diplomatic pressure having been put, off, put on them, the US 7th Fleet coming and not being able to do anything because of the counter pressure that India could put through Russia. Uh, their morale being absolutely low. Mukti Bahani, which you mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, sort of uh, creating its, its own mayhem because that was their backyard. They knew the area like the back of their hands. और उनको यह भी बोला गया था कि अगर आप सरेंडर नहीं करते हैं तो हम आपको मुक्ति बहानी के मसी पे छोड़ देंगे एंड मुक्ति बहानी वुड हैव स्लॉटर्ड देम 
because they had seen their women, their mothers, their sisters being raped, murdered, their property being burnt, looted. Who's going to leave you? And who's going to come to your aid? So that was the reason that Niazi agreed to surrender and he cried on that, on that table, which is understandable for, for any uh, military leader, senior military leader. There can be no bigger humiliation than to put, you know, customarily, I want interesting thing to tell you, a symbolic way that the senior officer he carries a pistol. तो वो उन्होंने अपनी पिस्टल हैंडओवर करी हमारे जनरल साहब को और बाकी जो जवान थे उनके हथियार राइफल्स थे जो भी थे रॉकेट लॉन्चर्स थे उन्होंने ढाका के रेस कोर्स ग्राउंड पे ये सरेंडर हुआ था सो दीस वर द रीजंस दीक्षा व्हिच लेड टू द सरेंडर सो इफ यू कुड जस्ट थ्रो सम लाइट ऑन द फैक्ट दैट हाउ इंपॉर्टेंट बांग्लादेश इज फॉर इंडिया स्ट्रेटजिकली ओके अ वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन एंड Uh, before that i'll just take 20 seconds to tell you something which uh, many of your viewers may not be knowing most of the people who have not been on the borders or who do not know their geography very well often think that we share the longest border with china or possibly pakistan but that is not true we share a 4096 uh, kilometers uh, another version says it is 4126 kilometers but chaliye let's take a figure of 4100 km border with bangladesh now that is the fifth largest land border in the world and you talked about strategic importance so i will cover it in a manner that your young non military uh, viewers understand a little bit you see most the, this border is with five indian states assam which is about uh, 280 odd kilometers uh, Uh, Tripura, which is about, which is pretty long, more than 850 kilometers. Uh, Mizoram, which is about 300 plus kilometers. Meghalaya, which is more than 400 kilometers, and the largest with West Bengal, which is in excess of 2,200 kilometers. All of them put together, measuring to about 4,100 or thereabouts. Now, you you must understand uh, that uh, the line which the British drew. between pakistan and india was known as the radcliffe line right whether it was in the western uh, uh, pakistan region or in the eastern pakistan region so the indo bangladesh border is still known as the radcliffe line a fact which may not be known to too many though of course that's there's a whole history behind how wrong ratcliffe went in his uh, as the british did a whole lot of messy things and left us in a total shambles not strategic importance what happens therefore i i mentioned the states of assam tripura meghalaya mizoram and west bengal that uh, bangladesh acts as a wedge between mainland mainland india and the northeast that all these seven particularly less sikkim the other northeastern states for them uh, the easiest and the closest route to come to west bengal or bihar or you know anywhere on our eastern coast is through bangladesh right so uh, and each of these states each of our seven states is landlocked now i i need not elaborate for intelligent viewers like yours the the repercussions of a landlocked landlocked state iska matlab hai ki samudra se aapke paas kuch saman nahi aa sakta so the economy is totally dependent on land routes okay so that is one point then you must understand that india and bangladesh are part of some very important uh, geopolitical groups for example the sarc uh, then you have uh, what is known as the bimstec bimstec many of you would know stands for the bay of bengal initiative uh, for multi sectoral and technological uh, and and technological and economic cooperation then there is something known as uh, uh, indian ocean rim association so once you are part of international alliances like they like these of which a number of other nations like south asian nations thailand myanmar and in some cases like the indian ocean rim states even kenya and and others are members of that then uh, it 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 does lend itself to certain strategic implications in terms of of support to each other the next point is the insurgency now you must know and your viewers must know i'm sure that Uh, a large part of northeast in fact all of northeast has been under the grip of uh, 
insurgency from the late 1950s. Now it is much less, but all of us old soldiers um, have served in those areas and we have seen it as what it is. So Bangladesh becomes a very important nation for us uh, to make sure that there are no insurgent or terrorist bases operating from Bangladesh. We have had great ties with Bangladesh and uh, it is thanks to those ties that, uh, uh, you know, even the Ulfa bases, etc., which at one time operated from Bangladesh, were totally driven out from there. So that is a very important strategic concern. Other than this, uh, you must know that a lot of Bangladesh officers uh, uh, train uh, in Indian military establishments, as do Indian officers in Bangladeshi uh, military establishments, right? Uh, and we carry out joint exercises. Uh, we have a cooperation in the field of peaceful use of nuclear energy, in information technology, in uh, cyber warfare, and in a lot of other things. The Chittagong port, now, you know, uh, Ch Chittagong port is a very important port which the Chinese are trying to cultivate. Now, India is surrounded by a very hostile neighborhood. Uh, we all know that. And we need good friends like Bangladesh. For example, if China were to ever use the Chittagong port, which it is trying to cultivate and build, given its uh, its policy of expanding and, and, and building like Hamantota in uh, Sri Lanka and uh, the other, other ports all over, the, like the string of pearls and all that. Uh, so these are certain areas of strategic uh, importance. Uh, and most important being, as I said, the 4,100 odd kilometers of border, land border that we share with Bangladesh. Yes, thank you very much. The story of guts, glory and heroism shall continue. We will return next week with more such untold stories. Till then, stay tuned and keep following Organizer.